Today on Straight Talk Africa, a look at the role and influence the African diaspora has on the continent. That discussion is coming up next, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters in Washington. I'm Vincent McCory in for Shaka Sali. Today we are discussing the role and influence the African diaspora has on Africa. Now, the African Union defines its diaspora as people of African origin living outside the continent. The United States and other nations have created initiatives and opportunities to engage directly with the African diaspora. Straight Talk Africa's Paul Diho reports. The term African diaspora is diverse, and multifaceted, and multigenerational, demographic, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality. The diaspora can be a powerful force for the development of Africa, especially through remittances, but perhaps more importantly through the promotion of trade, investments, research, innovation, knowledge and technology transfers. Remittances to sub-Saharan Africa grew almost 10% to $46 billion in 2018, according to the World Bank's latest migration and development brief. Margaret Mwonge, a native of Uganda, mobilizes her community to fundraise and collectively send money back home to help communities. A lot of money is being remitted to families back home, and that is done individually. And it has a lot of impact because it's even a factor in the budget. But if all these resources are leveraged collectively, the impact is much greater because you are not targeting an individual family, a brother or sister, you are targeting a community. Ethiopia, Africa's second most populous nation after Nigeria, is arguably one of the fastest growing economies largely due to its diaspora and the country's new policies encouraging them to return home. For example, this newly opened hotel is owned by an Ethiopian couple who migrated back from Washington, D.C. It's part of a growing series of businesses that started by Ethiopians returning from the diaspora to invest in their native land. We wanted to create something new here in Ethiopia that's never been seen before. One of the unique things about Washington Hotel is our presidential penthouse suite. It's really unique because the construction was done in a very dynamic way that separates us from any other hotel here in Ethiopia. Business officials said the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, home to the African Union headquarters, has tripled its number of hotels in the last three years. Roads and buildings are now a regular part of the city's landscape. The construction industry is being driven by the country's growing economy and Ethiopians returning from abroad. The technology flow coming up from abroad through the diaspora will be in the human aspect, soft skill, and also management aspect, and also in the hardware aspect. So they're going to be was an opportunity and a threat, but we believe in competition. Another area where the diaspora is shaping the narrative is the documentation of the African story. In the Gambia, the Fahen Network, a foundation run by a family of Gambian women in the diaspora, is promoting literacy and education back home. Anna Faye, her two sisters, and their mother, Lucy Faye, started the Fahen Network in 2007 as a hobby but it has grown into a powerful tool to influence young children and help them discover their heritage. Africans need to take over the narrative of telling the African story. We want to use the African experience, the African voice, the African perspective to teach others, but also ourselves, so we can be proud to say, here is the children's series written by Africans for African children, and of, of course, the rest of the world can also learn from it. As diaspora groups continue advocating for democracy and human rights across the continent, Africa's most powerful resource is proving to be the caring attitude of its people. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. Well, thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, joining us in studio today are three guests, uh, Yatunde Odubesan Omede, visiting professor of global affairs and politics at Farmingdale State College, Department of History, Politics and Geography 
a member of United for Africa United People for African Congress. Emira Woods, who works with Shine, a global campaign dedicated to ending energy poverty. She's also a member of Africa Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity. And Gizal Legese, founding member of Vision Ethiopia, a forum of intellectuals created to rethink the future of Ethiopia. A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Great to now, if I may start with you, Dr. Yatunde. Uh, the, uh, the Nigerian diaspora, for example, is like, uh, I think by some estimates, up to 300,000 here in the United States. Mm -hmm. How would you describe its uh, structures, organization uh, across the states? Um, right about now, we have what we call the Nigerians in Diaspora Organization. We also have the United People's African Congress. So that organization is what we call an umbrella organization, the NIDO, um, which tries to bring together all of the Nigerians in every single state, or also around the world, under that one umbrella, to see how we can ensure that the diaspora directly engage with those who are in elected office back in Nigeria, but also put forth an agenda of policies um, that will help to be more progressive to the society of Nigeria. And with UPAC, um, what I see with that is that it's more of a large umbrella, and under that it encapsulates the 54 African countries. And so it represents the needs and the concerns that those in the diaspora have mm -hmm. in their respective homelands. Yes, and I, I just I should have mentioned that uh, you are a native of, Ni of Nigeria. That's why I, why I asked generation. you that question. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that uh, there are so many other, you know, diasporians across the United States. Absolutely. We cannot bring all 54 countries here, Absolutely. but you, uh, you know, possibly will represent some of the thoughts and, uh, you Absolutely. know, views of uh, many Africans. Now, Emira, who happens to have origins in Liberia, uh, could also just uh, kind of chime in a little bit on uh, what you make of the organization of the Liberian diaspora. We know that uh, they have been in the United States for years, even through, uh, throughout the time of turmoil in Liberia. Uh, how would you describe how it's organized, whether it's a common agenda or not? Well, Vincent, thank you so much for focusing on this topic. I think uh, the Liberian community is very diverse and very um, broad. Mm -hmm. Overall, I would say that many have one foot on each side. They have one foot here in the U.S. and one foot on, on the Africa side and are working to, to bring their voice, their influence um, in a number of spheres on both sides of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So you have Liberians, uh, Rich Ludenis, quite uh, successful Absolutely. business leaders yeah. Yeah. in the U.S. that mm -hmm. understand their roots and mm -hmm. actually use um, their origins to propel their business initiatives. They are active, you know, um, you know, Rich Ludenis was the founder of uh, Seabreeze, mm -hmm. now uh, head, uh, owning mm -hmm. uh, Essence magazine. Mm -hmm. so, so you have a cultural icon that was rooted in the African-American community and that's now being kind of directed and under the leadership of, of someone who is from Liberia, right? Yeah. I think you have also Liberians that have seized the political um, mantle and you have people, you know, for example, Wilma Collins who ran for office and won in a red district in Montana, is now mayor of Montana, mm -hmm. who came out of a lived experience as a refugee mm -hmm. to be um, a, a mayor of Montana, and, you know, in, in the midst of uh, <laughs> the Trump era. I think these are some of the successes, but what you have is a community that has been organized um, uh, politically, that has been organized in terms of its economic power and economic role, and that is actually seizing new opportunities to influence both the home country, um, but also the U.S. and the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Giza, we just uh, saw in that package uh, some of the Ethiopians who lived here have even gone back home. But there's a huge population of uh, Ethiopians who live in this area. I, I live in the state of uh, Virginia in, mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. I kind of almost speak Amharic uh, because of the <laughs> just the sheer number of Ethiopians that I encounter in my life. How would you describe how this community is organized in this region and perhaps in the entire United States? Um, thanks for the opportunity first. Uh, Ethiopians are politically quite fractured, so when we talk about uh, politi politics, most Ethiopians in the, who live in the diaspora are fractured uh, along many different uh, areas. However, all of them, all of us, uh, have set up uh, democratic groups or advocacy groups for democracy and human rights in order to support uh, movements back home, advocate for prisoners, for political prisoners, advocate for uh, accountable government. So that's one area. On another area, 
as you said, we are many, many, many Ethiopians, and there is a significant number of Ethiopians who are much more interested or who believe that economic investment will change the country rather than politics. So there is a lot of uh, economic investment in different parts of the country. The other is the technology transfer. Most Ethiopians who are in the diaspora, uh, as you said, in universities and different high-tech companies, uh, do uh, go back and teach a semester or two. Mm -hmm. uh, Medical doctors, nurses yeah, go yes. back. I know uh, we'll kind of try to break it down yeah. as we continue with our conversation. We kind of established something I really wanted us to kind of uh, talk about briefly about the structure and the organization. And these are just three countries, but uh, we have 54 countries. Mm -hmm. But I think many of the African uh, Africans on the continent and others here can relate with what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. That there's so many of our, our people from our continent who are mm -hmm. here, and they're organized in some way or fashion. But uh, if now we can zero in, you know the actual uh, inter interaction with the continent and the mm -hmm. kind of benefits that are being transferred. Mm -hmm. Perhaps let's start with the whole question of uh, uh, um, this. Um, we mentioned it in our package, remittances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everybody in Africa or everybody who lives in the diaspora mm -hmm. sends money yeah. to, to the continent. I think Nigerians perhaps send up to $6.1 billion yeah. in yeah. one year. Across the continent is about $45 billion, which exceeds even what gets uh, in through uh, international organizations and donors. But if you, you may talk about it a little bit. Uh, how do you see it actually directly impacting the continent, the economies of our countries, say Nigeria or any yeah, other country yeah, that you may yeah. be familiar with? You know, the interesting thing about remittances is that when we talk about the influence and the impact that Africans in the diaspora have on the African continent, we always boil it down to remittances. And we understand the economic, mm -hmm. um, you know, shape around that. But to be honest, um, I think there are a lot more important areas that oftentimes are ignored. And, and I believe, like, in terms of social entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. in terms of civil society, yes, remittances are extremely important. And yes, a large number does help with the economic development and progression of the countries. But however, I also do see the power that um, Africans in the diaspora who are using, it's, it's we used to call it brain, dra brain, brain drain, drain, right? Mm -hmm. But to be honest, it's a brain gain. And why it's a brain gain? Because we have some skills and acquisitions and knowledge that we use and have learned here due to exposure and education, and we take that back home, right? Mm -hmm. We take that back home. We use that to solve certain issues that possibly may not be able to be solved on ground by those who are on ground. We are able to facilitate various dialogues. We're able to bring that knowledge, and that's extremely important. And there's certain things that are sometimes worth more than money and mm -hmm. worth more than remittances, yes. and that's the function of the brain. Okay. That's the intellectual capacity that we also wield. Okay. Now, you're kind of trying to read my brain because that was my question, <laughs> oh, but it was okay. supposed to come up later. Yeah. But that's good. Yeah. Uh, so we can also look at all the other vari uh, various kind of ways in which Africans are contributing to the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, Amira, uh, if I may come to you, I, I know that I've met you everywhere. There is anything about Africa, whether it is on the continent, <laughs> uh, in the United States, or anywhere else. You've been at the forefront advocating for uh, energy, for uh, elimination of poverty, okay, okay. Uh, and I think everything there is about the interest of Africans. So how do you see your role? How do you see the role of the Africans in the diaspora, not only in how they're organized here, but in effecting change on the continent? I see the diaspora as pivotal. We have one foot on each side. We have the benefit of insight influence and you know they say to whom much is given much is expected so the, the demands on us as the diaspora are many but we have risen to meet those demands and I think what you see you have examples all around mm -hmm. this brilliant Nigerian woman mm -hmm. you know um, uh, Jessica Matthews yes. who is she, she's an engineer and innovator mm -hmm. but she, mm -hmm. she created the using ball, yeah. you know mm -hmm. the ingenuity of yeah. how can mm -hmm. we bring energy with soccer balls mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with jump ropes yeah. how do we bring energy to our communities that have been so marginalized mm -hmm. and how do we use our creativity to leapfrog into our future kind of more just economies mm -hmm. and also more sustainable um, uh, environmental environmentally sound uh, practices. Mm -hmm. I think you have examples like this 
all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. and all over the world of Africans who are bringing their skills to bear um, for the benefit of the, of the continent and the world. Mm -hmm. I think you also see the influence of the diaspora in everything, from music, <laughs> you know? So clearly you've got mm -hmm. diaspora musicians mm -hmm. that are influencing top 40 hits all over the, the, the world. Yeah. You've got um, diaspora fashion designers. Mm -hmm. You look at, you know... Look at you. Well, <laughs> Because yeah. they are, you, you go into Forever 21, exactly. these mainstream yeah. stores, yeah. and you see African groups, right? So you see the influence of the diaspora yeah. in so many ways. You have diaspora leaders mm -hmm. that are writing children's books. Yeah. Dr. Rob Tell Paley, Chantel Bright, they mm -hmm. are writing children's books, mm -hmm. understanding that to reach the mind of children early on will liberate, will revolutionize mm -hmm. yeah. our continent mm -hmm. and our world. Mm -hmm. So you see the diaspora in so many forms using its brilliance mm -hmm. and also influencing. And of course, let us not forget, we have, you know, um, the amazing Ilhan Omar, yeah. who has come out of a refugee experience Absolutely. to be a That's powerful she. member of Congress, shaping not only U.S. policy, mm -hmm. but global policy. Um, and, and I think it is just the beginning yeah. of what the diaspora can do. And uh, the powerful voices of women is out. <laughs> If you don't watch out, we are outnumbered. Oh, we're just too busy. So you better put in your voice on that. I wanted to ask you, when we talk about the skills transfer, you are, mm -hmm. for example, an intellectual yourself. You're an IT expert. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked about the organization earlier on. We were talking about uh, Vision Ethiopia. You're kind of looking ahead beyond now for the development of Ethiopia. Question, though, is uh, to what extent are those back home in Ethiopia, for example, accommodating that, uh, uh, helping by creating structures that facilitate the return of mm -hmm. Ethiopians who are abroad, the mm -hmm. transfer back of those skills, the brain gain mm -hmm. that we were just talking about? Mm -hmm. To what extent is that happening? Okay, before I answer that, I want to also uh, chime in. There is yeah. another African uh, from Eritrea, yeah. Congressman Nugus. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. uh, so he is also mm -hmm. from Colorado. He's Colorado. a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you asked a very important question. I think we are lucky. Ethiopia is lucky. In the last year, Ethiopia has been transformed from a pure dictatorship to a reform. Mm -hmm. Now, the government, the different agencies of the government are collaborating to enable diaspora elements to contribute in their areas of expertise. So there are, for example, if you take Vision Ethiopia, we had a, a, a forum, a, a conference, to address all types of issues from corruption to democratic mm -hmm. transition to uh, diversity. And we are having a second one uh, uh, in a couple of weeks in Bahardar. The other issue is uh, we uh, Ethiopians are building a, a database where individual Ethiopians can uh, insert their skills that database will be matched with the different universities and the higher institutions or government agencies so that it will, it will be matched and the opportunity will be there. Mm -hmm. Some agencies uh, also, the government agencies, uh, are directly uh, signing MOUs, Memorandum of Understandings, mm -hmm. in order uh, to work on joint projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, Dr. Sunde, mm -hmm. you know, there's also another issue that always comes up when you talk about um, people in the diaspora and those back home. Mm -hmm. It is, the, of course, the disparity in, in, in the development mm -hmm. level between here and the, the countries back in Africa. Absolutely. And many times uh, the people in the diaspora are being, are being accused of going back home uh, with their noses up in the air and trying to impose what is seen as Western ways, Western values, Western standards, when actually they should leave Africa to kind of craft uh, African solutions to African problems. What's your take on that? Um, I don't necessarily agree with that because mm. um, Africans in the diaspora very much know the history of African countries. So Western imposition and Western ideals have been imposed during colonial times. So that's not something that... Um, it is new sort of to the forefront. I think what we are bringing back is a sort of experience that we mm -hmm. as Africans have experienced in the diaspora. How about the expectations where a person goes back home and they feel like the bureaucracy, perhaps the right. kind of management of things is right. kind of too uh, inhibiting. And, yeah. then, and then when you question that, mm -hmm. what is the response usually? Um, but, that's, but that's what having exposure gives you. When yeah. you're able to have, when you're able to see a system differently, yeah. right, you're able to now question 
regulations and things are in place. So those who are unable to see a different type of system automatically may assume that this is normal, right? Or this is normal behavior. This is the way that a government is supposed to run. But when you come outside of the, those countries, right, and you're able to compare and contrast, you're able to say, well, these policies may be better, or way, well, this government should be run this way, or here are some of the suggestions or recommendations or concerns that I have in terms of what, we, what is good governance, right? And we're not saying good governance is westernized government. We're saying good governance, right, is ensuring that, one, there's free and fair elections, one, there are institutions of education, right, that provide adequate education, that healthcare systems are running effectively, um, that people are able to find employment and live a decent life and have decent wages. These are some of the composites of what we call good governance. Mm -hmm. And it's not that, and these expectations, yes, we should have expectations. Even the people back home should have expectations of their elected leaders, in which they do. And then sometimes it's not upheld, mm -hmm. right? And that's where we come in, in a sense, and lend that voice and lend that helping hand and, and, and lend that advocacy that says, no, we understand what's yes. going on. We're here to support you. We understand the plight. And whatever we can do and use our platform and the opportunity that we have yeah. to push you know, uh, opportunities and to push, you know, prosperity and progression forward. That's what we want to do. Now, so we are all on the same page here. Somebody may say, well, that is what we wish and that is where yeah. perhaps the response and reaction of some people. But, Amira, is that something you've traveled across the continent? Mm -hmm. Do you find that as a, a kind of a... a yeah, yeah <laughs> sure. Because uh, there are countries where I know, I won't mention the particular country where uh, the government and some government officials actually treat a person from the diaspora almost as an enemy. Mm. They see a person who is from some other place or who has come back home to try mm -hmm. and, 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 and change things and mm -hmm. sometimes they see you almost like an agent mm. of some Western interest. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I can say, you know, even of my own country, Liberia, coming mm. out of 26 years of war, the mm. question of dual citizenship for Liberians uh, living in the diaspora has been very hotly debated. That's and right. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a surprise you know, sometimes to, to, to see the resistance, um, you know, at a time when the whole continent is moving towards, you know, citizenship mm -hmm. um, uh, for all mm -hmm. on the continent and for the diaspora to be yeah. welcomed through the African Union um, with African Union passports and the rest. It, it, it's almost like, you know, going against the grain. But you still have these tendencies of, we were here during the war. <laughs> we know it best, so mm -hmm. let us decide, right? And I think those those tensions are there, uh, uh, particularly in, in, in countries countries emerging from, from crisis. Um, but, but I do think that the, 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 the influence and, and, and you know, uh, potential power of the diaspora will continue to have its sway. I think mm -hmm. it will continue to be seen as an asset. Um, it has been historically. I mean, it isn't recent. We've, we've had diasporas really for centuries um, mm -hmm. in, 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 on our continent, and, and yeah. they've influenced from, you know, W. D. B. Du Bois, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, mm -hmm. Blyden, all mm -hmm. of these have historically had, had an influence on, on the, the shaping of the continent, um, and we have to also understand we have had continental leaders, um, Kwame Nkrumah, our, our, our Pan-Africanist hero, mm -hmm. right, who was educated mm -hmm. in the diaspora. U.S. in historically mm -hmm. black colleges here. So you have had these ties that that bind the diaspora and the continent, and I think it is um, it is I think important that the African Union is recognizing the power of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Uh, understanding that the diaspora with five regions of Africa, diaspora is region six. It, mm -hmm. This is this is a critical uh, component of the mm -hmm. of the, the future of the continent yeah. and reaching out in fundamental institutional ways to incorporate the diaspora in policy making and, yeah. and, and the rest. I think um, these are all steps in the right direction. All right. Now, Gizel, uh, in terms of uh, people returning home and the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia has actually called on Ethiopians to go back home to invest, but also probably to stay back there. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get the sense that many Ethiopians are willing to go back home given the, you know, perhaps the stage of development of the country and perhaps uh, some social issues and even political environment? Yeah, I think a vast number of Ethiopians would like to go back home. Actually, a number of Ethiopians, I mean, I, I will guess I will uh, I, I think 30, 40 percent of Ethiopians living in the diaspora already have built houses in Ethiopia. Mm. But uh, I think the more important point is even those who do not want to go back uh, to Ethiopia, people who, as I said uh, earlier, teach and work, have uh, skills, are willing to go and teach in colleges, mm. and not live there permanently, but contribute in their areas of expertise. Um, so uh, the other thing what Dr. Javi has done is he has opened up the embassy 
to all the diaspora. Mm -hmm. It's very simple now to go to the embassy, and the embassy's outreach is is uh, very empowering to the rest of Ethiopia. And Ethiopians are, as you guys probably know, a very close society, if I may say so. So our really. Uh, Mira was talking about one feet here, one feet there. I, I suspect that in our case it's one and a half feet there, one here, <laughs> because we eat the same food if you come to my house and all that stuff. But to touch on to the issue of uh, expectations, I just came back from Ethiopia. Yeah. It is true when you go to Ethiopia, the expectation that we uh, have is not the same as the expectation of the people who live there. Mm -hmm. But that opens their eyes. Usually those who complain are the service providers or the politicians, because we are introducing. Usually I, I give an example. If, you, if your phone is 3G and somebody using 5G, you are shaped to expect a 3G environment. Mm -hmm. Once you, ha you have a 5G, Absolutely. you expect a much faster thing. So if we express those expectations in a, an affirmative way, in a positive way, rather than in uh, patronizing way, I think it is a good thing. It's mm -hmm. true, our expectations are mm -hmm. higher. Sometimes there are resentments about that. But when we look at it, we are to go forward, I think expectations have to be raised. Another last point I want to mention is, I think it's good for the African the AU to recognize the diaspora. I believe the AU is primarily uh, not a democratic institution. So mm -hmm. I would advocate, like our group, we should be, the diaspora should be the one who should outreach to the uh, people of Africa mm -hmm. and empower them to, to go forward. Yes. Now, in a few minutes before we go to break, uh, Dr. Yatunde, there has always been like, uh, 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 you know, uh, groups of African politicians, you know, governors and others always coming to town, mm -hmm. especially very close to elections. Mm -hmm. uh, why? What is the role of the African diaspora in the local politics? Um, I think it's a big one. I think recently, not too long ago, there was a leadership conference, diaspora leadership conference happening at the Nigerian consulate, mm -hmm. where some of the elected officials did come from Nigeria, come from Abuja, to discuss um, how they can engage the diaspora community in Nigeria. Um, and you know Nigeria passed the Diaspora Commission, um, which is a commission-based um, organization federally funded by the government to streamline ways that we involve and engage the diaspora communities in the affairs of the Ni of Nigeria. Now, with that said, um, I think they're starting to see the, the power that we wield, not only just, and I always say, not only just boiling down to remittances, but in ensuring that we are putting together policies that are um, reflective of the needs and the concerns of those who are in Nigeria, but also policies that have a dual nature that can mm. also benefit us back here, back home. Does the endorsement um, also give them a more credibility back home um, by the diaspora? Maybe. I think it does. I think it does, but it's also about follow through and yeah. carry out, right? Yeah. And they're starting to understand that things are no longer face value. So it's not about just having meetings and just meeting with us, and, but we want to see what is being carried out. We want to see the follow up. We want to see what is the next steps and what are the next stages and how we are being engaged and what capacity you are utilizing the Nigerian diaspora. Like I said before, um, I always say it even here in the United States, we wield a strong power, even in elections here. And, yeah. and I think that's a power that we also need to see in ourselves, right? There are mm -hmm. other communities here in the United States that are very, very um, vocal yeah. when it comes to national elections here, local mm -hmm. and federal. Mm -hmm. And I think Africans in the diaspora here in the United States also need to be vocal as well when it comes to that. So it's, we, we play a dual role in making sure that our presence and our voice is heard here in the United States and in our respect, respective homelands. Mm -hmm. uh, just quickly, before they tell me to take a break. Yes, I think we, we are playing an even more powerful role in terms of helping to, to you know, they, they have um, diaspora leaders that are going to run for office. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I, I think are, one, uh, one important yeah. point I want to yeah. mention is like in Ethiopian yeah. case, mm -hmm. we created an uh, Ethiopian satellite television. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there was a monopoly of the government of media. Mm -hmm. So that's a pressure point. Actually, mm -hmm. we believe we contribute significantly by breaking the monopoly of the government on information. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <coughs> there are many avenues through which the diaspora can uh, influence yeah. the government. And we'll continue this conversation. Uh, let's take a break. You're tuned into Straight Talk Africa. And we'll have more about discussion in a moment. <laughs> Our 
voices. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Well, we appreciate all of the audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. So be sure to watch our show there and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, an exclusive interview with the Prime Minister of Buganda, Charles Maiga. Buganda is the largest, most influential kingdom in Uganda that includes Kampala, the capital. Buganda and the future on the next Straight Talk Africa. Well, today we are talking about the role and influence of the African diaspora. Our guests are Yatunde. Odubesan Omede, visiting professor of global affairs and politics at Farmingdale State College, Department of History, Politics and Geography, and she's also a member of the United People for African Congress. Emira Woods, who works with Shine, a global campaign dedicated to ending energy poverty. She's also a member of Africa Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity. And Gizal Legacy, founding member of Vision Ethiopia, a forum of intellectuals created to rethink the future of Ethiopia. So, uh, if we go back uh, to what I, I wanted to, let me, let me go to Emira, um, because, because of the way I've watched you in your activities here and elsewhere, uh, in terms of uh, what role the diaspora play here in Washington and how it ex the extent to which it affects or has influence on the African continent, what would you say? Because there are people who see you know, protests or demonstrations or Africans at the, at the Congress uh, fronting issues that are to do with Africa. Uh, what, what do you think that pl does on issues that affect Africans on the continent? So I see the diaspora as the ambassadors of our countries, <laughs> right, on our continent. I think the, you know, often you have embassies that do a formal role, but the diaspora plays a much more powerful role because they actually elevate issues way mm -hmm. before the U.S. media, the international media will pay attention to an issue. The diaspora is there talking about it, beating the drum, making sure that those issues are spotlighted. The diaspora is a convening. You have on Capitol Hill, Congressional African Staff Association mm -hmm. made up of diaspora working on both sides of the aisle. Some are Republicans, some are Democrats, but they're coming together to elevate the, the interests, the, the, the needs, the policies that relate to Africa um, to help bring about a stronger Africa and a better world. These are diaspora in a day-to-day -day way that are using their influence to, to shape public discourse, mm -hmm. to shape policy, and to actually shape the future. I mean, we have to look not only now, but look historically. The anti-apartheid struggle, the whole push to, to liberate our continent mm -hmm. came because the diaspora also played a role. It's those on the continent and those in the diaspora joining hands mm -hmm. to demand liberty and justice for all. And that is still the mantra for today. Whether it's people organizing around uh, Bring Back Our Girls or, or Cameroon and the, and, the, and the issues going on in Cameroon mm -hmm. or the, the Horn of Africa, South Sudan, mm -hmm. Sudan especially, 
you see young mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. poets often, yes. right, in the leadership of yes. these movements. The last demonstration on with Sudan that I went white, to, yeah. led by young women, mm -hmm. who had thousands of people, mm -hmm. mostly Sudanese, but not exclusively. Mm -hmm. There were mm -hmm. Africans from across the continent and the diaspora, African Americans especially, mm -hmm. present to say, we stand for justice. We stand in support of change mm -hmm. in Sudan. And, and people, you know, were, were organizing. This is what the diaspora is doing. Mm -hmm. And I think what we see is especially young diaspora leaders involved in, for example, the Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. in the leadership of the Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. using social media in creative yeah. because ways. Because at the end of the day, yeah. we're also black. Absolutely. And then sometimes exactly. some of those issues exactly. touch on everybody who's a everyone. person exactly. of color. Uh, just a little bit about, you know, we mentioned uh, some of the elected, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Africans to mm -hmm. positions uh, of, uh, you know, of, 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 of uh, leadership here mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we have organizations like the United People for mm -hmm. African Congress. And yeah. we know they advocate a lot mm -hmm. for more Africans getting involved mm -hmm. in American politics and mm -hmm. possibly getting elected. Yeah to an African sitting in Abuja or mm -hmm. in Nairobi or, or Liberia, mm -hmm. why is that why should th that be of interest to them? Um, it should be of interest to them. I remember, you know, during my time, you know, in, in Newark, New Jersey, with the African Commission, um, and we brought a delegation of um, city and state officials to Nigeria. And just through that linkage, was able to create a sister city with um, Lagos and Newark. And, and that bridge partnerships. Um, economic partnerships, um, educational initiatives. So it actually does matter and actually does have weight when an elected official is of African descent where they can use that duality in the position that they have to either promote or engage in initiatives that will serve as bridging the gap between the Africans and the diaspora, their constituents, and, and, and opening that, that door of opportunity and welcoming those who live in their communities to the African continent. Many of those state and city, um, a city and state officials that we brought to Nigeria, they'd never been to the African continent before, mm -hmm. you know? So for them, it was an eye-opener and it was an experience of, wow, so how do we engage this rich history mm -hmm. into our own, right? How do we facilitate um, such magnificence and innovative work that's happening there? How do we bridge that gap? And so I've even seen here, you know, as a professor, we're very big on, you know, a, a global, you know, issues. And so what we always do is that how do we also connect with educators who are back home, right? Mm -hmm. So we have systems in place where we are able to talk to educators who are in various universities in, in African countries to see what the common dualities and, and different synergies are um, to expose our students. So if I teach a course on imperialism, right, and so if we go to the scramble for Africa and I'm teaching them about the history of Africa, what best ways for them to also engage and, and also understand the history of Africa by also even seeing students face to face yeah. with the technology yeah. that has been afforded to us. So there's so many ways of synergies that um, those who are in elected position can create to foster this idea of global collaboration that we're, we're mm -hmm. seeking. Yes, and uh, Gazelle, definitely, the Ethiopian community very involved in po local politics, but also, of course, in business. Uh, you see that as a, a person in Ethiopia looking out and saying, we can learn a lot from our brothers who, are, who left the continent uh, and, and are doing great things across the, the oceans. You see that? Yes, we, we, uh, as we said uh, earlier, many Ethiopians uh, bring their families. Mm -hmm. They go to colleges, they, t they get trainings and go back home. Also in the business area, as, as you said, the business incubation uh, will be started here people here will be financing some projects and transfer the, the, the skills they observe. I think one other area I want to talk about is uh, our presence, the other impact, the very important impact is our kids. Yes, our you. kids yeah. are cross-pollinated or introducing Africa, yeah. not through, uh, through written mm -hmm. words, mm -hmm. but practical life in, in, in every university from Harvard to yeah. Ivy League schools, there are Africans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they have friends from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So Africa will be represented not only by us, by yeah. our kids. Yeah. Our culture, there are, as you said, there are so many Ethiopian restaurants, Ghanaian mm -hmm. restaurants, mm -hmm. African restaurants. Mm -hmm. So the diaspora uh, should be, uh, this, uh, its contribution is not only the current one. As we go forward, our cultures will be impacted, cross-pollinated by artists here Absolutely. versus Ethiopia. There are collaborations. Mm -hmm. Ethiopian artists here and there, they mm -hmm. collaborate. In mm -hmm. Ethiopia, there are people who do 
uh, rap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was never known yeah. rap, but it is done not in the fully American way, mm -hmm. but in a cross-pollinated way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, I, I think the important part, I think, as we approach this is what we should work, our generation, what, should, what we should uh, concentrate on is to ensure that our kids yeah. are tied to the people back home and they will continue to contribute uh, in that area. Yeah. I'm a first generation Nigerian American, yes. born, oh. and, born and raised here. Yes. Um, and so fortunately my parents brought me and my brother back to Nigeria over the summer to visit family. And what I realized growing up, I said, you know what, There's a, this is who I am, this is my identity. I am a Nigerian American, and I should be very, very proud of that. And so what we're seeing now in this generation is that they realize that in order, you don't need to lose who you are to chase the American dream. Mm -hmm. That the American dream is composed of being um, proud of who you are. Yes. You know, we're proud of our names, right, of our cultures, and we bring that to every aspect in the workplace, in the classroom, in our board meetings. Because again, as we, as we kind of, we're that representation of America and also of, the, exactly. of, of, of our country, of yeah. our, where our parents come from. And so we don't need to lose one to appease the other. Yeah. That we can balance the two and we can yeah. do it in a very beautiful and innovative and progressive way, and which is where you're seeing the new generation yeah. of the children coming yeah. in. Yeah. I know, I know one, my son used to tell me would uh, be very kind of disturbed when he gets a, an immigrant kid saying, oh, my parents are from Nigeria, mm. I'm American, mm. but it's like you really could did, you cannot deny your uh, yeah. identity. You mm -hmm. may have been born here, but of, mm -hmm. of Nigerian uh, yeah. origin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I feel like I, I, my, my children, who I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of, you yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're beautifully dressed like you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. They're here with us today. Mm -hmm. I'm really honored for that. Um, and, you know, they, they, they grew up knowing that they may have been born in, in the U.S., but right. they are African. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and they, so they are, in essence, African Americans. Mm -hmm. And they, they own that. Mm -hmm. they, they own that, that kind of joint dual heritage yeah. and they also carry it you mm -hmm. know they're both students of public health and mm -hmm. so they carry it into their yeah. you know chosen yeah. profession and so yeah. I think we've got to I think uh, I saw that your, up as I, like I saw your son yeah. Yeah. Don't lose hope. When he turns a little, little older, yes. he will claim his... <laughs> his kid. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. He's there very frequently, so he's, yeah. he's very kid. Yeah. There's no problem. No my, my kids are like, now yeah. they have flags, they are yeah. art yeah. from yeah. Ethiopia. Yeah. Yeah. If they buy art, they yeah. buy Ethiopian yeah. art and all that. Yeah. So yes, no apologies. Saw, they can't I, escape I, it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 what do you call the thing? The license plate holder on the car. Oh, Maryland. Yeah. 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 100% Liberia. Yeah. Oh, I was hugging the horn. It's things like that that you see, especially young people yeah. they are mm -hmm. identifying yeah. and they're, they're, it's, it's extraordinary yeah. to mm -hmm. see yeah. and I guess one concrete example at the time of the Ebola crisis mm. in Liberia was an amazing opportunity it wasn't just Liberia it was Liberia Guinea mm. Sierra Leone mm -hmm. mostly impacted and now you see a similar um, crisis in mm -hmm. Democratic Republic mm -hmm. of the Congo yes. but there you have diaspora te technicians right mm -hmm. people who bring the technical expertise yeah. they are techies um, wanting to use the skills mm -hmm. that they have, mm -hmm. have have learned working mm -hmm. around the world mm -hmm. to um, improve the, the, the health so, systems in, yeah. in our country so I mean, what you see is like concrete yeah. skills yeah. with, uh, with your heart yeah. Yeah. dedicated to improving the continent and building a better world right. and those two are coming together in to create new innovation Mm -hmm. in areas of, yeah. of clean energy mm -hmm. in, in clearly yeah. um, in areas of, of health care yeah, as well. Actually about I think 26,000 Nigerian doctors here. But yeah. I, if I may stay with you because in terms of the especially the politics of uh, mm -hmm of the, you know, the African countries, you know, there's a lot of ethnic, uh, yep. ethnizations mm -hmm. of that, or weaponizing mm -hmm. ethnicity yeah. uh, for political ends. Mm -hmm. um, how do those in the diaspora help change uh, perhaps uh, the traditional way of seeing politics where people get uh, balkanized along ethnic lines, especially uh, during election time mm -hmm. or when there's some issues that are really uh, kind of a very, uh, very um, critical to the future of a country. How do you do that? Because there have been accusations that some of the African uh, people in the diaspora mm -hmm. have become even more ethnicized mm -hmm. than even those back mm -hmm. home. Yeah, that is true. In Ethiopia, That's particularly, true. our politics has been ethnicized. Actually, the biggest challenge for Dr. Abi is politics, the currency of politics is ethnicity. Mm -hmm. You become a minister because you are from this ethnic group mm -hmm. or that ethnic group. The, I think the contribution of the diaspora uh, is very, very significant. There are a few ways we can we can uh, we have approached it. One is 
uh, in Ethiopia during the previous uh, two governments, Malas and Haile Mariam, all the media was controlled by the government and all the uh, news, propaganda, all anything that was done ethnicized. It was presented in an ethnic framework. By opening uh, radio and TV stations abroad, we broke that. We, uh, we enabled different ethnic groups to have their own programs, uh, their own broadcast uh, programs, so that people back home can see that we can work together. We are one people. We want the same thing, but to, uh, in terms of politics, we don't have to ethnicize our politics. The other thing is, uh, I think one of the most important things we do is how we live here. When we live here, the cross-pollination, uh, you know, we meet, we go to the same churches, Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. We have food from different ethnic groups in our restaurants. We go to the dif different meetings and debate, like uh, I mentioned Vision Ethiopia. We invite the, uh, the different, uh, the, inter the elites of the different ethnic groups to debate the issues. So. These are the type of issues we have been doing. And also, in, in back home, we support both materially, uh, in terms of literature, in terms of studies, uh, we support those political forces that try to de-ethnicize the politics mm -hmm. back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Etunde, yeah. uh, as a, a, the, a big uh, African diaspora, we mentioned something about the African Union. Mm -hmm. Is there a way the African Union, as, as an umbrella body, uh, can tap into the African diaspora? Is, you know, uh, as a whole, not, not necessarily looking at the individual, uh, you know, country-based uh, groups. I think absolutely. I think there's, you know, formidable ways where they can devise a plan of how they create and have a roadmap of unity. Um, a unified, as if as as their you know priority is to create a unified African nation, you know, with the 54 nations, but at the same time a unified African diaspora where we all see ourselves under one umbrella, right? And that we don't necessarily have competing priorities and competing issues, but we actually have one same agenda, and that same agenda is possibly for a, a unity, same good agenda for great education good governance, ethical leadership. And so these are things that will cross all country lines that many people can agree with. And I think if they create a roadmap where there are four or five major pillars that are universal in language, right? Mm -hmm. um, so creating almost like a universal declaration of human rights, but maybe a universal declaration of African unity, yeah. Yeah. right? And what that actually outlines. and. I think that's sort of a strategic way and a strategic step um, for them forward. Um, they still have a lot of work to do, but like I said, I think uh, with the skills and the knowledge that we have, we're always here to provide those recommendations and those those policy outlines that's necessary to create yeah. such a strategic plan. Yeah. And one thing I've seen that uh, perhaps being in the diaspora has given some kind of a different perspective and, uh, and advantage is that someone like, you know, all of us here, Mira, suddenly you see yourself more of an African citizen than Liberian even. Well, so. I see myself as a Pan-Africanist. Uh, Pan-Africanist. So, <laughs> so <laughs> some of the things, you've been out there, you're fighting to fight, uh, you know, to eliminate yeah. poverty across yes. the continent, to mm. uh, to end uh, this, uh, you know, the chronic uh, shortage of electricity and all that. Yeah. At a point, at, at the level of the African Union, do you think, is there a way that could be recognized such that just the same way we have... Um, the African Union representative here in the United States, uh, Dr. Chomburi, mm -hmm. that there could actually be a representative of the African diaspora mm -hmm. to the African Union yeah. who can mm -hmm. go and articulate some of the issues which help the African Union to say, okay, this is how you know, you could represent us up in yeah. Washington or yeah. in the UK or whatever the case well, well, a few years ago, the African Union did have a summit of the yeah. African diaspora mm -hmm. in South Africa, and there, there was a, a, you know, so the plans have been yeah. there, but, yeah, but I think, you know, not properly perhaps resourced, and, and so the implementation may have not been as it, as it could be, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the idea is that this Region 6 would be a vital uh, link for yeah. the continent, and that there, you know, things like the diaspora database, which were started in the diaspora summit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to bring forward a database of diaspora skill sets mm -hmm. across the board, and to create a database that would be uh, accessible uh, to the African Union. Mm -hmm. This was one of the, the the initiatives. Clearly, the African Union and its mission here in Washington D.C. has put forward um, diaspora bonds yeah. and and ways that you know resources could be uh, generated mm -hmm. to go towards critical uh, initiatives mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. especially of mm -hmm. the of the continent and of the yes. of, you know. 
of the African Union, uh, to have it less dependent on you know, foreign mm -hmm. uh, entities, yeah. right? Yeah. To have the diaspora more of a source um, for that. I think, you know, the, the, the elements of it are there. I mm -hmm. think um, more needs to be done to kind of jumpstart mm -hmm. uh, the implementation to make sure that, that it reaches its full potential. Mm -hmm. um, I do think outside of, of government, outside the African Union, you have groups like Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity mm -hmm. that not only reach out to social movements across the continent, but also reach out to the diaspora and have that as a core part of their mandate. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, whether it's social movements or governments, mm -hmm. there is this recognition that the diaspora is pivotal mm -hmm. um, for achieving, uh, achieving the goals. Mm -hmm. and, and when you you have again a continent that's at the at the epicenter of, of climate catastrophe. Mm. You know the continent that that, that is, has uh, contributed the least, you know, in terms of, of of dirty energy, right? But but has actually suffered the most in terms mm. of the, the rise in temperature already. I think what you have is a continent that is ready to use the skills of the diaspora to say, let's unleash all of our capacity, all of our creativity, to make sure that we're solving um, the dilemmas of the future. Things like energy energy poverty yeah. and, the, and other key challenges of the continent. Yeah, let's get Giza here. And uh, do you think this perhaps could call for a more unified or perhaps a new uh, the African diaspora organization, which could bring uh, people of the different countries together and form some kind of uh, a body that will also kind of represent uh, the different, uh, you know, uh, nationalities that are here in Washington or in the United States. That way there could be a common voice, you know, one voice that can be representing the continent in Africa at the continental level, Africa Union level. Yes, I, I very much agree for, need for, uh, for the need for such an organization, particularly uh, we should start small. It could be advocating for Africa in the United States or mm -hmm. in some other, or advocating for green energy mm -hmm. or it advocating for democratization. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said earlier, I don't expect anything from AU, uh, African mm -hmm. Union. I, I think African Union, uh, as you say, as we implied uh, uh, a little earlier, are a little bit too scared of us, uh, I don't know what the right word is, mm -hmm. because we are exposed to more accountable, mm -hmm. more transfer governments, mm -hmm. they may be a little suspicious. But I think the social activists or the intellectuals and the professors and mm -hmm. the young students uh, should start a group which uh, starts with a very narrow uh, scope, if you will, uh, choose two, three areas where we can leverage our resources, our knowledge, our skills, and then address it. I mean, I think we, the South Africans, apartheid case, a case an example. I remember when we had a lot of demonstration on Mass Avenue, mm. on, uh, you, you probably remember. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we need uh, an affirmative case. It mm. could be democratization. Mm. So, for example, there are failed state like Somalia mm -hmm. or oh. I don't know we, we can case yeah. uh, um, South Sudan South Sudan, South Sudan, yeah. South Sudan yeah. 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 or Cameroon mm -hmm. I mean the Anglophones yeah. and the yeah. Franco mm -hmm. even Ethiopia mm -hmm. until a year ago mm -hmm. I think we need to start something small focused and the success we get out of that will feed and grow this effort. Mm -hmm. But it is very important also if we start now, as we talked about, the young people around us, our kids, mm -hmm. will follow that. And the next politicians in the United States, in England, in Germany, mm -hmm. will be yeah. at least exposed to Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. If they are not Ethiopians or uh, Liberians, Liberians or mm -hmm. Nigerians, mm -hmm. Nigerians already mm -hmm. are uh, very Kenyans. well represented. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think if we start narrow yeah. and focus on it, we have a good chance to yeah. improve the livelihood of uh, all Africans. You see, I've yeah, thrown a challenge out yeah. there. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's we have a young population bug, bulge yeah. in the African continent. Yeah. So I think the age was 24. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of people in the African continent are under the age of 24. So yeah. again, that that is a critical area. That is a critical area, and we see that a lot of our issues is emanating also out of either um, ignoring that area, um, uh, not providing the needs yeah. um, that's necessary to young people, where it's you know good education, employment, um, ensuring that they don't fall into any sort of deviant acts because there are no other resources that are available to them. Um, so you, you know the elected officials, you know at some time, you know their time will you know pass because yeah. you know we know with the whole Godfatherism and you know politics in African countries and in other 
parts of the world, um, but there's a need for a transfer of power. Yeah. And there's a need for a new generation to now assume leadership positions. Um, and, and hopefully we may see a shift once that does happen. Mm -hmm. But until then, if those who continue to hold on to power and don't want to relinquish it to the yeah. young mm -hmm. people, we're going to continue going through conflict and mo the motions of uh, a, a, a desperate sort of population that, that desperately wants to see the progression of their country but are unable to sit in the position to do that. Yes. I want to take one question ar uh, around. Mm -hmm. it, th one of the things that has been very disturbing, and we have very few minutes left, is that you see African leaders, mm -hmm. uh, when they fall sick, they go abroad, they go to uh, London, for yeah, example, yeah. and spend mm -hmm. months there being treated by a Nigerian doctor or an Ethiopian exactly. doctor. Is there a way in which the Africans in the diaspora can actually, instead of, uh, you know, I'm not saying they don't welcome them, but actually challenging them to instead help uh, build hospitals back home, and then they can get whatever help they need from the diaspora to equip those hospitals. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they are doctors. Mm -hmm. They're doctors that they come to see here mm -hmm. are mostly doctors from Africa. Then they can go to Africa and be treated there as a way of also dignifying the people they represent, mm -hmm. that they have hospitals that are good enough for them such that their people can also believe and schools that, that they're good, good enough, enough for them. For them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head, Vincent. I think the critical issue is that there are some systemic problems that mm -hmm. have to be addressed. If you continue to have, let's be frank, you're here in Washington, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, these international financial institutions yes. saying, don't spend on public sector, yeah, yeah. education, programs, health, yeah. right? You know, um, deprioritizing those basic building blocks of healthy Absolutely. societies. It will be impossible to address the problems mm -hmm. with healthcare. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to say is we've got to push against privatization of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Healthcare should be affordable and, for, and available for everybody, yeah. as should clean Edu energy, yes. so yeah. that people yeah. have a yeah. right to kind of have lights to, to, to read the books, to be yeah. able to educate their mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. So these fundamental building blocks should be available to all and government resources again we've got to figure out the proper taxation absolutely uh, Africa is a wealthy continent yeah. yep. but yet you know the, the, the multinational yeah. corporations are not paying <laughs> yeah. their fair share absolutely. so you have so an outflow of resources or so years after influence. independence yeah, Africa shouldn't be South, we, you know, yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. we need the resources on the continent right. yeah. for clean energy yeah. for health care yeah. for also yeah. education yeah. for all yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, Dr. Ali, the very popular Ethiopian minister, prime minister, just had a meeting with the doctors. Mm. The, uh, the uh, most, I think, except a, f a few hospitals, all hospitals are owned by the government. It's a public hospital. Mm. So the doctors uh, and the health uh, uh, staff asked to, for a meeting with the prime minister. He met with them. Uh, he addressed mm. them for a few hours, and he was heavily criticized. Yeah. The mm. issue you raised was was raised. Mm -hmm. Why you guys, politicians, go to Thailand or mm -hmm. South Africa mm -hmm. or London, yeah. and this was raised. I think, to me, one of the things uh, really we should concentrate on, I, I mean, is we Africans, particularly given that the uh, typical Af is the average African is 70%, I think, mm -hmm. is less than 24. Mm -hmm. We need to start from being responsible. The individual African mm -hmm. has to demand democracy, accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what we see in Africa is either through ethnicity or through mm -hmm. religion yeah. or through some temporary thing, we allow the governments to cheat us, to be yeah. honest. We, mm -hmm. we allow them to stay in power and buy uh, different okay. expensive cars and go abroad. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, uh, let me give you the last word mm -hmm. here. We have just uh, mm -hmm. less than a minute. Yeah. So. Um, so I basically think that, you know, the African agenda should be the number one priority. There are many competing agendas. They have the Western agenda. You mentioned the IMF and the WTO yeah. and the World Bank. And yes, they have their own agenda as well. But if we also want to see a progressive African nation um, where the 54 countries are coming together and putting the priority of not only the young people, but ensuring that education and health care are one of the major areas of security, um, we can really come together and and really and really emerge into the Africa that the world should know us as um, there's natural resources that are that we have that are a gift to us it's not a curse right um, they say petrol politics right but the idea is that how do we harness that how do we harness the innovation that comes out of the young people in our population how do we engage the African diaspora and I believe that we have put forth policies recommendations okay. um, to do that well we'll have another time another hour to continue yeah. this conversation Thank you.
<laughs> on that note, our guest uh, uh, today, where well, you tuned in, Oruk Besan Omere, Emir Woods, and Gizau Legacy. Thank you to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. And from all of us here in Washington, have a good evening. Thank you.